So say I didn't know where I was this morning and I woke up and I said to you, where are we? What would you, what would you say? Well, you're sitting on one of the most westerly points of, of the United Kingdom. Um, we're on the very west coast of the island of, of Lewis and Harris. And uh, right next door is the Atlantic Ocean. So if you sailed across, straight across, you'd really hit America quite quickly. So we're very remote and very exposed to the, the, the wind from the Atlantic Ocean. for people of these islands is greatly more than another industry or a job or a cloth. It's um, part of my heritage and, and, and my culture and um, it's arguably in the veins of people um, who live in these islands and um, this organisation has a, a huge responsibility to, to hold that and keep it safe for future generations in the way it was there for me to come and work in. The, the Harris Tweed industry was created on the passing of the 1993 Act of Parliament, which um, superseded before that the Harris Tweed Association. And um, if you think about in 1909, when the Harris Tweed Association was formed and registered for the Orb trademark, um, you know, these must have been really hard and difficult times. And, and it took real vision to see that the Harris Tweed industry needed protecting way back then. Fast forward to 1993 when the need to formalise the trademark into something which had um, more teeth, as it were, to, to protect what you know this island has has built up and and holds so dear. Um, the Act of Parliament was successfully applied for, and the Hazard Authority was was formed. Um, our role uh, is to protect and promote this industry. The Hazard Authority hold and trust the trademark for the people of the Outer Hebrides and we uh, we might be a small organisation but we punch above our weight in protecting what is so dear to these islands. Um, we fight um, battles all around the world uh, to ensure that what is genuine and authentic Harris Tweed cannot be passed off or counterfeited. That has become a much greater role for the Harris Tweed Authority in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a role to tell the genetic story of this beautiful industry in this faraway place. Mm -hmm. has a really strict definition in law. Harris Tweed must be hand woven at the home of the weaver from 100% pure new wool. The yarn used in the production of Harris Tweed must also be entirely made in these islands and the finishing process. So in essence, while the Act is a lengthy document, legal document, it boils down to four key points uh, that every aspect of the production of this cloth must be done in these islands of the Outer Hebrides by weavers, by hand, from 100% pure new wool. And our role is to ensure that that is the case. As you know, in a world where a lot of companies are more or less inventing an heritage, or if they do have an heritage, if you mm -hmm. just scratch behind the first layer mm -hmm. of, of the, what they say, very frequently you just you know, stumble over, uh, on something which is more industrial mm -hmm. than artisanal. 
But the reality that I discover these days that we, stand, we, we spend on the island all together with my team, it's almost um, shocking to see how far this company is going in protecting the way of doing things. And um, it's something that was not really, um, in my opinion, the, the image I had of your company and even of the Harris Street community, because we can talk about the community, right, uh, was something a little bit, I'm sorry to say, uh, dusty, a little bit, you know, from the past, mm -hmm. something, um, um, a company that was struggling a little bit mm -hmm. to survive, but the reality is very different. As far as I know, your business is booming, and then there's a new generation, right, yeah. arriving in this company. Yeah. I mean, we respect our traditions. They are integral to the quality of the product, but like any other industry, we want to be better. You know, we want to make patterns that appeal to a world market. We want to involve ourselves in accessories and the luxury market where we should be. So we're always looking to make the perfect product. We respect this provenance that we have and this unique dynamic whereby the landscape, the people, and indeed the Harris Tweed industry act as one. There's a word in Gaelic for this called dulcus, which literally means always together, respecting the landscape and the environment, and at the same time, having a community spirit. And although Harris Tweed is not family owned, as some uh, may think, that is indeed a myth. It is very much about the community spirit. It's about working together. The mills and indeed the Harris Tweed Authority and the weavers are all dependent on each other. We need the weavers to weave the fabric, and indeed the weavers need us to provide them with well-carded, well-spun yarn that of course they can weave into the finished cloth. Another question, uh, maybe uh, we can focus on another myth or maybe on another re reality about Harris Tweed. Um, is that I saw this beautiful book, which is closer to, no, to a work of art of this man called Jan Lawson. And as far as I know, this man spent many years on the island uh, photographing the landscape and also the fabric. And he managed to build a bridge between mm. the, the landscape and the fabric. So is it a myth that the inspiration, the main inspiration for the design and the colors of uh, Harris Street fabric are coming from directly from the land? It's absolutely true. And I think the more time you spend in the islands, you appreciate that. The first thing that uh, the chief executive, Ian Angus McKenzie, said to me when I met him 10 years ago was, just be careful, Harris Tweed's a bit addictive. And he's absolutely right. It's the colours inspired by the landscapes. It's the changing seasons, you know, from the, the earthy browns and greens of the autumn all the way through to the macker colours when the summer flowers begin to bloom in June. If you look at the colour palette, a unique original colour palette of Harris Tweed, it represents these different colours. Everything is really inspired by the landscape. Truly speaking, from the land comes the cloth. Mm. I really uh, thought before visiting you that the Scottish people were strange. But oh, now yeah. I can confirm <laughs> that you are uh, really different people and then you really believe in what you do because every single people we have been, every single person we met had this, the kind of the same engagement inside this realm. I think perhaps in the past we were guilty of not singing quite so loud as we could have done about the complexity of the process, about the beauty of the process. And indeed, trying to explain that the weaving is just part of Harris Tweed. Because even once the uh, weaving is finished at the home of the weaver, it will be transferred back to the mill where finishing takes place. And this is where the balance of tradition and modernity kicks in. We still finish in a very, very traditional manner, but we're always looking to tweak that tweak it to make the fabric better, but also to respect the traditions and indeed to give a variety. So we do three finishes, three weights, uh, but of course now with the accessories, you know, we can send it to various other mills where a coating can be applied. So we're very open to that. Harris Tweed is Harris Tweed after it's stamped. But of course, if you are 
a streetwear brand and you want to print onto it, if you're an accessories brand and you want to paint onto it, then that's absolutely fine by us. Today we're here with Margaret Ann McLeod of Harris Tweed Eberdays, and from what I understand, we are on the Isle of Lewis, is that right? Yes, that's correct. I'm thinking about Harris Tweed, and I know it's got a long history, but I'm going to ask you to back up in your mind a little bit before Tweed even existed here. Can you just describe what that was like? Well, it was a very harsh existence for, for the people that were living on the island. They were very self-sufficient and they were staying in uh, croft homes, the homes on the small pieces of land where they were surviving. They were staying on those homes and looking after their animals and fishing. Fishing is uh, very big. Obviously, we're surrounded by the sea and we have lots of, of lovely fish and shellfish on the island. But they were self-sufficient on the island and uh, very exposed to the elements. So it was a harsh existence for the people that lived here um, over a hundred years ago. I, I understand there's a, a very uh, touching story that happened in uh, 1919. Mm -hmm. And there's a commemoration that's coming up. Uh, will you speak to that for us today? Yes, well, in, in 19, in January, on January 1st, 1919, the um, ship, the Isle Air, was coming back to Stornoway with lots of um, seamen and other army personnel that had been in the war um, and the Merchant Navy as well and had been fighting for their country. And unfortunately, as it came back into the Sandwig Bay and it's Stornoway, back into the town, the port of Stornoway, um, the ship hit the rocks and really very quickly uh, went underwater. Um, so it was a, a massive disaster for the island. Um, almost 180 local people did lose their lives and it really impacted the whole of Lewis and Harris at that time. There were uh, some survivors, is that yes. right? Yes, and, and I, I don't know the number. There were some survivors, 30 or 40 survivors, 30 or 40. that managed to get um, a rope to shore and then managed to, to um, escape from that tragedy. But it's a tragedy that's been kept very private. Um, families didn't generally speak about it, um, and these things were kept very private. But a hundred years on, we feel it's a good time to, to recognise what happened on that night and to commemorate the people that did lose their lives. And for the survivors, it was a very traumatic experience. walk us through the process um, from the point of beginning with the wool and ending with the product? So the um, Scottish Cheviot wool arrives at the mill and it's been cleaned after it's been sheared and come off the sheep. It's cleaned and then is packed and delivered to the mill. So when it arrives in the mill, the first thing we're going to do is fibre dye the, the wool. So the Scottish Cheviot wool is broken into 50 kilogram batches and we're going to fibre dye that, which basically means we just gently want the, the wool to absorb colour. And at Harris Tweed Hebrides, we're working with over 60 base colours in our dye house. And once we've dyed the wool, or left it natural, if we're wanting to use it to lighten colour, um, we'll start the process of blending the wool. So when you're blending wool, you're literally working with a recipe, and we have over 170 unique recipes for our you mean yarn. ratios, like how much blue, how much Absolutely. red? Absolutely, okay. yeah. Same as making a cake. Have you got all your ingredients? Ah. So the, the blending process helps to aerate the wool after the dyeing process and mix those colours together ahead of carding. So after the blending the wool, we move on to carding. And literally at the carding frame, what we're doing is brushing out the wool. So each of those wool fibres is in a straight line and is a fine sliver of wool by the time it comes out the far end of the card. So after carding is done, your carded wool has no strength, 
so you can't really do anything with it until you put it on the spinning frames. So you remember the big spools were moved onto the spinning frames by the operators and what we're going to do on the spinning frame is put that twist, mechanical twist, into the yarn which then gives you a, a, a yarn you can use for weaving and it's a, a product you can move on to the next stages of production. The, the twist serves to hold everything together and give it strength. Absolutely. So the warpers will have prepared over 1,400 individual warp threads and each and every one must be the exact colour and in the exact order. The weaving card that's been prepared for the warper is then transferred to the weaver along with the warp and the weft threads. So they have all their tools delivered to their home ready for that project, that next project that they're going to work on as weavers. Um, we have a van and a lorry that go round the island of Lewis and Harris every day delivering to the home weavers. That's lovely. So they have to have their sheds, their weaving sheds, um, at their own home as a regulation, but also close to the road for practical purposes. Is there anything um, unusual or any fun facts that we should know about Harris Tweed? Um, some fun facts about us. Um, Harris Tweed Hebrides produce over 75% of all Harris Tweed that's available in the whole world. <laughs> Right here. Right here in the village of Shawcross. So, Brian Wilson, um, my first question is, um, I, I've been thinking a lot about this. We, we, it's, it's been two days. We've been two days in these islands. And we've been seeing some things that are, can be qualified as anachronism, to say the least, the way the wool is produced, uh, the way the weavers are weaving at home, the way... And my first question is how a man like you, you've been, as far as I know, serving as a minister for the United Kingdom government, how does a man like you um, come into this world of the, uh, of the Harry Street Hebrides? Or, or to put it shortly, uh, what is your connection with this environment and this community? Well, I came into this world long before I went into the world of um, of politics, and in many ways, the the values and the character of this community informed my political outlook, and in probably my motivation in getting into politics was uh, to uh, actually try to implement some of the uh, changes, some of the um, the economic measures that were needed in order to give places like this a chance to survive and flourish. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of interconnection. I'm a journalist by trade. I, as a politician, I, I now do a, I'm now involved in Harris Tweed. But there is a, there is a thread runs through them. Um, but at the start of that thread is this place, places like it in the, in the Hebrides uh, of Scotland, uh, and the, the values, the distinctive features, um, which I actually think of quite a lot to, to teach the world. Of course. Of course. And um, do you have personal connection with the community? Is it part of your family, part of this island? Well, my particular connection with, with this island is that it's where my wife comes from. Oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and where we, where we now live. I mean, this was a, you know, this was a really poor place. This was a very, very uh, poor community um, which subsisted uh, on very small scale agriculture and a, a bit of fishing, um, but what kept people going was Harris Tweed, cool. and in like in the village uh, where uh, where I live and my wife comes from, and you've seen, you know that that uh, there were probably twelve weavers. There would be about fifteen houses, but twelve of these would have have weavers at yeah. their looms. Right. So when you multiply that throughout the island, that that, that uh, every village, ev almost every household. Uh, was involved in the Harris Tweed industry one, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And that was undoubtedly what kept the place going through the, 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 the hard times. Mm -hmm. um, you come to the, the 1980s, uh, and huge amount, amounts of money have been taken out of the island for, because it was a very profitable industry and fortunes were, were made on the back of it. You come to the, the, the 1960s, 70s, it's beginning to go into a bit of a decline. The warning signs are there. Uh, because of the, some competition of uh, lower quality products and cheaper, I suppose? Well, I think uh, two or three things. W one was undoubtedly the move away from natural uh, fabrics towards uh, synthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but also that there were a number of mills at that time and they, which I think is probably a, you know, quite common in, the, in this industry, that they were more interested in fighting each other than they were in seeing the world changing around them. And between these two factors, the North American market was, was virtually wiped out within a very short space of time. Uh, and that was the beginning of a decline in the, in the Harris Tweed industry. Um, but I think you need to know, I think you need to understand how important it has been in order to recognise how significant it still is. The Harris Tweed only survives as an industry here because of the regulation that surrounds it. Yes. Um, it, it, it survives because of the definition which that the fabric must be made from pure virgin wool, hand woven at the home of the weaver in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. And if any one of these criteria was lost, then the industry would be lost because mm. if it could be made somewhere else and if it could be made differently and called Harris Tweed, mm. then it would be made somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, it can't be. Therefore, it is our industry as a community. Uh, and But integral to it is that definition and these, uh, call them restrictions or tell, call them, I would call them assets. Mm. That's interesting. It's fascinating even almost because... Um uh, sometimes we look upon this kind of uh, strict laws and strict regulation more as an obstacle, you know, to creativity. And uh, and what I discovered this last two days, it's it's not an, not only it's not an obstacle, but it's uh, it helps preserving uh, not only um, from an economic standpoint, but also from a quality standpoint. That is to say, and I understand that. Um, this connection between the weavers and the mills and all the gestures, it's a very complex process. I mean, I was very surprised. I know wool, we've been uh, traveling a lot, uh, visiting many mills and, and seen the process. We've been visiting people to, working with cashmere, with vigunia. So we know this kind of um, people using thistles, flowers, still to comb the wool. But I've never witnessed something that far in terms of artisanship. And um, I'm very impressed about the fact that it has an impact on the quality of the product. It has an impact. Of course, you can add also that these people put a little bit of their soul inside that and their history and their family history. But that's something that, that was really fascinating for me. Customers who say, if it can't be a pound cheaper or a dollar cheaper, then we're not buying it because we can buy something that doesn't have any of these characteristics or challenges. Exactly. So we are dependent ultimately uh, on customers who recognise that money isn't everything, that price isn't everything, and that in order to value the product, you have to know something about it. Yeah. And in some ways, the biggest tribute to Harris Tweed is you know, that, that many clients, they buy it because, because, or partly because, you can attach the label, the, the orb label to it. But some of our highest-end customers don't use the label. Uh, they don't say this is Harris Tweed. They buy it purely yeah. for the quality. the quality, and that is a that that is a tribute to not only to everyone else who uses it, but also it's a it's a kind of it underwrites um, what everyone who buys Harris Tweed is actually mm. buying. That's very interesting because this um, this is also something we really uh, deep dive in for years uh, with uh, my team is, is this, um, this need of education because what is mesmerizing almost is that, okay, in the market, as you said, yeah, when you're in front of a buyer who buys, let's say, hundreds of meters, if not thousands of meters, yes, he's going to negotiate. And maybe for him, there's no real distinctive feature between a Harris tweet and a tweet from God who knows where from. But uh, what is interesting is that um, today we, we uh, understand, we see this, is that the final consumer, the final consumer are more and more educated. Uh, I mean, we participate to this movement since uh, a decade already, and we've been, um, well, let's say, educating or passing on some know-how, some heritage, some, some, and then there's a new generation of gentlemen, specifically in menswear, because that's our trade, but also I hope, as a gentlewoman also, uh, who are more interested uh, and they buy the history when it's true. Yeah. They really love to, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's almost metaphysical, it's almost transcendental. This is you buy something that is a little bit larger than life, that is a little bit that will, and in case of a Harris that maybe survive you.
you, that, uh, you we, don't, we, don't, we don't do planned obsolescence. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so this is why I believe strongly in the future of this kind of company, if some people like us d do the, the job under education, and if you tell the story loud enough in this uh, cacophonic world where everybody wants to have a share of voice. That was a beautiful visit for us here, Mr. Wilson, and we are really thankful that um, you, you welcomed us in this beautiful island. Glad you came.